Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. We're very, very excited to have you all here. My name is Jonas Rosslin. I'm an open source community manager here at VMware, and I will be your, be your host today. Uh, this is a webinar series where we're introducing and explaining some of the interesting open source projects that stem from VMware. And the topic of today is a project uh, called uh, the vSphere Cloud Provider Interface. Um, we're also going to talk about Bosch, um, which ties into this. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please add them to the Q&A. You will see a button down, uh, down below in your Zoom window. Uh, please use that for any questions, and we will ask, answer them throughout the presentation. Our speakers today are Yashwant Babar, uh, Niha Jain, uh, Tushar Agarwal, and Karim uh, Elgam Rawi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Yashwant, who will start the presentation. Thanks, Jonas. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about Bosch uh, and VCS API today. Um, I'm Yashwan Babur. I'm a product manager um, here at VMware working on Bosch and CPI. Uh, over here, I also have Neha, Tushar, and Karim with me, uh, who are the engineers working on uh, Bosch and CPI. Here's the agenda for the day. Uh, we are going to be talking, we're going to briefly be talking about Bosch uh, and what vSphere CPI is. Uh, we'll touch upon our vision. Um, then we'll talk about all the things that we've done so far in the last 10 months. Um, then we'll hand it over to the engineering and then uh, we'll, we'll take a look at how the director, Bosch director and CPI interact with each other. Um, and then we also look at under the hood to see um, what actually happens underneath when during key workflows. Um, and we also have a bunch of demos lined up for you guys. All right, so what is Bosch? Uh, so Bosch is a very popular open source project that was initially created to deploy Cloud Foundry. Uh, while it was being used to deploy Cloud Foundry, they realized that it's generic enough that it can essentially deploy any distributed system or application that's out there, right? Um, right now, Bosch is being, um, Bosch is the backbone of two uh, major products that are out there, which is PCF um, and PKS, which stands for Pivotal Container Service and Pivotal Cloud Partner. Bosch essentially focuses on four key areas. The first one is it really simplifies the deployment of your applications. Um, all you have to do is you create a deployment manifest, which describes um, how you want, want your application to look like and just provide that to Bosch, and Bosch is gonna go ahead and deploy the application for you. Secondly, it also manages the life cycle of that application. It's not just about going ahead and deploying an application in production, but you know, there are so many things that happen after that. You want to release patches, you want to release, uh, you want to upgrade to the latest version of the application or something of that sort. Uh, Bosch has support for rolling upgrades, which can upgrade your application with uh, minimum to no downtime. Um, thirdly, it also focuses on monitoring. Uh, it can monitor the VMs that are running your applications. Um, it has an agent in every VM uh, that Bosch creates, uh, which speaks to the director. Um, and if uh, the VM stops responding, Bosch can go ahead and restart those VMs for you. Uh, it can, and it can also monitor your applications, which are essentially processes that are running within that VM. Uh, and Bosch uses Monit uh, to take care of that part. Last but not the least, uh, it can also help with release engineering. Uh, Bosch has a construct called as uh, releases, which essentially packages all your source code, dependencies, and tools um, in one release. So it can really help you understand in every release what are, the, what are the exact contents for each release. Bosch is also IS agnostic. There's a CPI layer uh, underneath Bosch, uh, which helps Bosch to talk to different uh, cloud providers. And we're going to talk about CPI in, a, in, a, in the next slide. So what is a CPI? Uh, CPI is an abstraction between the Bosch director and an IaaS. It's the thing that makes Bosch uh, really cloud agnostic, right? Um, and the way it achieves that is by defining a, a set of methods uh, which are essentially an interface, right? Uh, so Bosch, when you deploy an application, uh, all you care about is creating a VM, creating a disk, um, attaching this disk to a VM. Um, 
And then Bosch expects that each of the cloud provider uh, implements this interface. So for example, a create disk in vSphere would look like a VMDK, uh, but would look totally different for let's say uh, AWS or GCP. Um, so every IaaS has their own implementation for all of these methods. And it's the CPI layer which allows Bosch to be you know, truly uh, cloud agnostic. Um, there's a CPI for each IS that's out there. So there's a CPI for AWS, a CPI for Google, Azure, OpenStack, and of course, vSphere. Um, all, most of these CPIs are owned by their individual companies, except AWS, and AWS CPI is still managed by uh, Pivotal right now. Uh, just something to throw out there, 75% uh, of Cloud Foundry customers are currently on vSphere. Uh, so vSphere CPI is one of the most widely used CPI uh, in the Bosch community. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, about our vision, right? Um, our vision is to really make vSphere the best IaaS for Bosch to deploy applications to, right? We really want to bring all the goodness of vSphere uh, to the Bosch and Cloud Foundry world. Uh, and there are two parts to this. The first part is, uh, vSphere has been around for a really long time, and there are lots of features in vSphere uh, that a lot of our admins and developers really love, right? Uh, for example, stuff like data store clusters or storage DRS, which have been around since 5.0 or 5.1. Uh, uh, so we, our focus is also to gain some sort of feature parity uh, for all these older version of CPIs and uh, bring all these very valuable features to uh, the CPI and Bosch world. Uh, so that's the first part. Uh, and the second part is uh, vSphere with every new release is releasing really cool features. Uh, and we want to add these features as soon as possible to the Bosch and CPI world as well. An example might be uh, vSphere 6.5 added support for uh, VM encryption. Um, so that you can encrypt VMs uh, at a per VM level and you don't have to encrypt the whole data store. Or, um, you know, VM4, if you guys haven't heard about it, uh, it uses instant clone technology uh, or methodology to spin up VMs uh, on the fly. Uh, so it's twofold. So we want to gain feature parity with the older vSphere releases, but we also want to introduce new features uh, in vSphere that come out uh, as soon as they're available. Uh, so what have we done so far? Um, so we took over the CPI uh, about uh, a year ago from Pivotal. Um, and working on the CPI really involves two key uh, areas, right? So the first area is actually maintenance. And the second is adding features. Uh, and we can take a look at that uh, in a bit. So for maintenance, we do, we have been fixed, we fixed about 15 bucks so far. Um, and as a part of maintenance, you know, it we also involves a lot of testing. Uh, we support and we have pipelines which span uh, vSphere versions starting from 5.5 uh, all the way to 6.7, which was released uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we test across all of these different versions of vSphere CPI and make, vSphere and make sure that Bosch and CPI is working fine with these versions. Um, we also test across different versions of NSXT. So we have, so we have um, NSXT pipelines for 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, to 2.3. Uh, and if you look, look at it, right, if you, we have to test across the whole M cross N metrics between the vSphere and the NSXT. So we have a pretty large footprint when it comes to pipelines. Uh, but I guess that's something which brings a lot of value. Uh, and I think uh, for us to certify that things work with certain vSphere versions, it's really important. Uh, so a lot of effort goes in actually maintaining these pipelines, testing across different versions, uh, and fixing bugs. Uh, but then we also, as we spoke earlier, we add new features as well. Um, while adding new features, we really keep two personas in mind. Uh, one persona is your data center administrator, uh, which is your VI admin. Uh, and the second persona is vSphere. Uh, sorry, vSphere, sorry, developers, right? Uh, your data center admin is responsible for managing your infrastructure. Uh, and if someone's deploying Bosch in that environment, environment uh, they really need some sort of visibility into that environment as well. So, the first thing that we addressed was reducing the number of permissions that Bosch needs uh, to deploy on top of vSphere. Prior to this release, uh, Bosch needed some really extensive permissions uh, at a pretty high level. You know, we asked permissions at the data center and the root level, uh, which was uh, 
for people who are trying to deploy Cloud Foundry or Bosch in a multi-tenant manner, or uh, for people who do not trust their developers to have access to the whole vCenter, um, this was a huge problem, right? So you do not want anyone to just be able to see, make modifications to uh, your vSphere. So we fixed this problem in the last release, where earlier we used to ask for about 15, uh, 13 to 15 permissions. Uh, now we've reduced it down to just one permission. Uh, and we have plans to fix that as well uh, in one of the next releases. Uh, the next thing that we fixed for the data center admin was giving him some visibility, right? Um, the v we added a plugin, sorry, uh, an extension for v in the vSphere UI for Bosch. Uh, what it did was, uh, or so now let's say you're, you're, you're a developer using Bosch and you're spinning up a bunch of VMs and all these VMs are going to pop up in uh, vSphere and your data center admin has no clue uh, what these VMs are. Um, and if they don't know anything about it, they might do something to it, right? So if they start just powering off the VM, that's gonna, you're gonna incur some downtime on your applications. Um, so to give data center admin some visibility, uh, we um, added an extension which will let the admin know that this VM was not, well, when the admin starts, tries to make any changes to the Bosch deployed VMs, we pop up a warning message saying, hey, this VM was not deployed by you, but it was deployed by Bosch. So are you sure you want to delete this, right? Uh, and, and, and things like that, just to give him some visibility. In the next release, we are also planning on um, uh, helping admins to even see, as a part of that extension, all the VMs that are created by Bosch. So you know he has better visibility into those things as well. Along with that, now addressing all the other uh, developer kind of stories, for the developer persona, we've added support for storage DRS, data store clusters, We've added support for VM groups, uh, added support for NSXT networks, security groups, load balancers, and you're gonna see demos for all of these today. Uh, and uh, when uh, we do the demos, we'll dive a little deeper into these features as well. Along with all of these, we've also re-architected uh, the CPI to make it more extensible. So going forward, our release cycles could be even faster, um, and we can add more features in a cleaner manner. Um, and we also included some uh, better logging. Uh, along with the contributions to the CPI, uh, we've also been making um, some contributions to Bosch itself. Uh, while we were working on PKS, uh, we noticed that uh, Bosch can uh, manage the whole life cycle of your storage and compute, uh, but it lacked the functionality uh, to manage the life cycle of a whole network, right? So Bosch could create um, uh, disks or uh, VMs on the fly, uh, but it cannot create uh, networks on the fly. Um, I'm happy to announce that in the latest Bosch release, um, uh, the functionality that we've added in Bosch is now available in the uh, in alpha stage. So if anybody wants to go and play around with it, uh, they can do that. Um, Karim is also going to be demoing um, these things and can talk a little more, bit more about that then. Uh, going forward, we're also planning on working on the uh, load balancer lifecycle as well. Uh, with that, uh, well, are there any questions right now? No questions right now. All right, awesome. Cool. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Tushar, who's going to be talking about uh, the boss director and the CPI interactions. Thanks, Yashwant. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Tushar. I'm an engineer working on CPI team. Um, I'll walk you through some of the key workflows and how director interacts with CPI. Um, so the director is the main orchestrating agent um, in the whole uh, system. It gives issues commands to CPI and other components to uh, deploy VMs and uh, attach disk and do all the networking stuff. CPI as a job is co-located on the board director VM and has uh, uh, a board director sends messages to CPI via some predefined RPC contracts as just discussed earlier. Bosch crunches and digests the three configuration manifest, which is the global configuration, cloud configuration, and the deployment manifest, and takes in all the information regarding the uh, VM creation specifications, as well as location specifications, and passes it down to the CPI. From here on, the CPI takes all this information and talks to the underlying cloud, which in case of vSphere CPI is vSphere, and creates the cloud entities. Some of the key workflows like VM creation, managed networks, and VM groups will be covered in the webinar.
So we are moving on to the work, um, our workflows and demos section. Um, so the first workflow that we are going to discuss today uh, is about placement engine and related workflow. In the next few slides, we are going to talk in depth about how CPI chooses a cluster, data store, and network for various resources like this. The new placement workflow that I'm going to discuss now is introduced in release version 51. Although it does not impact any, uh, any user from using old CPI, externally facing, it's all the same. You specify the very same things in the global configurations and your cloud configurations, and things work the same. It's just how internally we have changed things, and I would like to give you some sneak peek into it. So the placement workflow basically describes a process in which we gather, filter, and sort all possible placement resources for a VM or a disk. So what is a placement resource? Um, to do any placement, um, you need two things. One is a placeholder, where the VM or disk will go. And another is the resource, where I want to, uh, another is the criteria on the basis of what I want to choose my resources. Uh, so among the three major resources that I have listed here, compute, storage, and network, all these refers to, uh, like compute refers to wash, easy, and clusters. Storage refers to data store and the storage pods. And network resource refers to uh, uh, network specifications gathered from spec. One of the things that I would, I would like to highlight here is, uh, in case of a disk, um, network and compute resources are not applicable, it's, it's, as it is only a data store file. Um, in cases of network resource, uh, we also support opaque networks, like in NSXT, apart from standard vSphere switches. Discussing a little more about the placement uh, resources, a compute resource uh, might refer to Bosch AZ, a liberty zone in the Bosch world, which refers to vSphere clusters in the CPI world. And AZ can be made up of multiple vSphere clusters or can refer to only one of the clusters. And then finally, um, uh, it also refers to resource pools and hosts. There is a way we can specify resource pools in the cloud configuration, which we have not covered in the webinar, but we can look up on our documentation how to do that. Uh, as for the host selection, we let the DRS do the work. DRS is dynamic resource scheduling, which is a part of uh, vSphere, and it's a service that runs on vCenter, which helps uh, um, a VM to choose a host, uh, depending on various factors like the utilization of memory and CPU. A storage placement resource, as I said earlier, refers to a data store cluster or data store. One of the workflows regarding storage pods will be discussed by Mr. Neha later on in the webinar. Uh, another point that I would like to highlight in the case of network resource is, right now in the CPI, we assume that all the networks are connected to all the compute resources. We do not base our selection or placement on the basis of network. Um, moving on to the next section, I want to describe how our placement engine looks like. So our placement engine is, uh, is basically a, a big pipeline with three stages in between. Uh, first is the gather, followed by filtering, and then sorting. As the name suggests, gathering is just basically gathering all the possible uh, clusters and data stores specified in manifest. Uh, I repeat, it's not the clusters and data stores present in the V center, like all the clusters and data stores, but only the clusters and data stores that have been specified in our manifests. Next stage is filtering. Uh, the step uh, starts by uh, filtering a uh, single placement at a time. It considers various filters uh, in succession. Our filters can be based on free space, memory, and data store accessibility. All these filters are currently not exposed externally to the user. And the ordering in which filters are applied is locked. Uh, although theoretically, all the filters are required to be mutually exclusive, but sometimes in some edge cases, some filters are not. After all the valid placements have been filtered, and we have got other list of all the valid placements, we sort those placements. Uh, we sort all those placements on the basis of migrations, um, free space, and uh, the amount of memory available. And we might come out with a, one of the placements with a better score. And that's how we proceed on to select and place the VMs on. So um, now it's uh, time for the demo. Um, so in our demo, I'll probably uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate how um, how um, CPI load balances the VMs across clusters. So I, I'll do a very simple experiment in which I'll start a single instance, and then I will increase the number of instances to two, and we'll see how those things get balanced. Um, so to start with, uh, we'll go through our uh, vCenter. As we can see in vCenter, we have a data center with two clusters underneath it, vCPI cluster one and vCPI cluster two. Each of the clusters have two hosts. 
Next, moving on to the data store section, uh, we have a data store called IceCASI. To point out the fact that we have a lot of data stores here, but for our experiment, we'll only be using the clusters that I'm going, or the data stores that I'm going to highlight here. So one is IceCASI CL1 DS1, which is only accessible from cluster one. Another one is IceCASI CL2 DS0, which is a, a IceCASI data store only accessible from cluster two. And the last we are going to use NFS, which is a shared data store, uh, which is commonly accessible from both the clusters. And the last is uh, the network resources. So we have like uh, two NS60 switch one and NS60 switch two, which are opaque networks. But for this experiment, we are used to use VM network, which is a standard switch in this way. In, in, the, in the meantime, we were deploying our Bosch director, which is finished, and we are uploading the release and stem cells we are going to use. Stem cells are like the paused or a powered off VM, which are used to create all other VMs on the Bosch. Later on, the jobs and specific things are installed on them, so they behave as per the application needs. Next, we are going to look at a, a cloud config.yaml. Um, this YAML or JSON file is basically describes your cloud infrastructure on vSphere, how it looks to the Bosch. So we have uh, our start by defining uh, AZ, Availability zone, which has two clusters. Again, VCPI cluster one and the VCPI cluster two, as we defined. There is a persistent disk type. There are two disk types, default and large, and both are stored on shared data store, and that is zero one. Moving on to the network, as we saw earlier, we have a network which uses standard VSphere switch VM network, and the name of the network is default. And the VM configuration, we have two types of VM configuration, default and large again. Both of these uh, configurations um, uh, are using data stores, ISPC CL1 DS0 and CL2 DS0. Now these data stores are different from the data stores that we mentioned earlier, because these are for ephemeral disk of a VM, as against a persistent disk of a VM. Now we'll open the deployment manifest of the Zookeeper release that we are going to deploy. And if you look in here, you will see that we are going to deploy this release in Availability zone Z1 with one instance, which means like we'll be deploying this VM on Z1, which has two clusters, cluster one and cluster two. We specify various other things also. And now um, we'll uh, <coughs> basically upload this cloud config to the Bosch. And then we'll start deploying our release onto the Bosch. And we'll see that the release is getting deployed and it's creating missing VMs, updating the VMs. And in the end, we'll see on the vCenter. We can see here that our VM is deployed. There is some problem with the video. I'll just reload it here. Yeah. So we can see the director VM and the uh, and the main VMs are present on the cluster one. And we'll go back to the our deployment manifest. We'll increase the number of instances to two while keeping everything same. And then we again deploy the release and we create the missing VMs, which is one more VM. And as we navigate back to the vSphere, we'll see that second VM has been created on cluster two, which we were hoping for. The recently created VM. And now coming back to the uh, this thing, we can also verify how the placement happened through our logs. We, we can uh, go through the recent task list in the Bosch, which will show us the task which we ran last, which is basically the deployment of Zookeeper. We are going to the logs of this, release and we open the log we'll notice that we are initiating a vm allocator with vm placement criteria and the criteria is various disk and various uh, required memory going forward we see that all the filters are being applied and the storages are being rejected or selected based on various factors and finally, we can see that we create a VM with, on the chosen cluster in the data store.
So this completes our demo. Some of the important things to note in a demo is a placement selection pipeline is nothing but a constraint satisfaction problem with some intelligent scoring in the end, as we saw. All the valid and scored placements are picked one by one and until the VM or disk creation succeeds. It might be a case in certain scenarios that a VM creation fails due to lack of resources and we might want to retry the creation of VM or another valid placement. And then it's a generalized place, uh, pipeline framework which allows developers to create their custom resource pipelines. For instance, uh, the recent GPUs like we did, we created a host selection pipeline. Um, with this, uh, I'll complete my uh, demo um, and hand it over to Neha. Uh, one thing, last thing before I go uh, is the logging and debugging, which I just demonstrated right now. The command which you can use for uh, logging and debugging is uh, listed here. If you don't omit the CPI flag, it shows you all the logs from Bosch. But if you apply the CPI flag, it shows you CPI logs as well. Um, so yeah, with this, I'll hand it over to Neha. Uh, do you want to take any questions right now? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Are, are there any questions for, for this thing? Uh, yes, we um, we got one question here from Brandon Pittman. Uh, he asks, can you use Bosch to deploy a nested ESXi environment, a non-prod environment? So all the cloud environments uh, are, are, are supposed to be present before the Bosch deployment. All the vSphere and all the cloud configuration is, uh, is assumed to be in place before we start the Bosch deployment. And then uh, in the cloud configuration, we can specify as many uh, cloud things we want. But for deploying the nested ESX, uh, I, I think the question is more around, um, can I use Bosch to actually deploy uh, ESX like, on top of a VM that Bosch deploys? Yeah. And the answer is probably, I mean, we have never tried it, uh, but it seems something that's doable for sure. Okay. Okay. I'm not starting to sell Cool. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question here regarding uh, vSphere CPI. How long does it take for uh, vSphere CPI to add support for newer vSphere releases? Um, so, we, whenever the new vSphere releases are about to come out, we actually start uh, testing the alpha bits um, at least a month in advance so that when the vSphere GAs, we already have support for. Um, these new VC versions uh, when uh, on the day when it GAs. So yeah, we, the day uh, vSphere GAs the version, uh, we have support for that less than in less than a week for the most part. Cool, that's really cool. Thank you. Also, we keep the badges on our uh, on our GitHub repository. There are badges which show like the state of pipelines. And it can be used uh, by the by the community to check on what latest pipelines are being run and which pipelines are being passing. So as Neha is showing you on the screen, we are supporting lifecycle 6.7 test, which is 6.7 vSphere and with NS62.3. Any more questions? Not right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to walk uh, you through some of the key features of CPI, like VM group, data store cluster, and server pools. Uh, I'll talk more about them as we go through the demo. Um, so let's switch over to the demo first. Okay. Um, since demo takes a little bit of time to deploy, this is a recorded demo, and it was the same case with the shot. He recorded it because it takes time to do a live deploy. Um, as part of this demo, I've already deployed my director. Uh, I've already, I'm using a Zookeeper release for this deploy, which has also been updated. Uh, let's take a look at the cloud campaign. Uh, as part of this demo, the first thing that we're going to look at is VM group. Uh, as you can see in this cloud config, I have specified a VM group, CPI VM group. Uh, I'm using OPIC network, which is NSXT in this case, uh, to deploy uh, this release. Um, if you see, I've specified uh, two server pools, CPI pool one and CPI pool two, as part of this uh, cloud config, and a security group called as NS group two. Uh, as we go through the deployment, I'll talk more about them. And the last thing is, uh, if you look at data source for this uh, 
VM type. I've specified a data store cluster as well as a regular data store. So in this one deployment, I'm going to talk about VM group as well as server pools, as well as data source clusters, all three of them together. So we uploaded our cloud config and now we start deploying uh, this release. Uh, while the release, while the deployment is taking place, let's take a look at our v center. So if you look at cluster one, and if you go and look at VM and host group, there are no VM host group listed over here. The way you can use VM or host group with CPI is you can create a VM group. Uh, along with that, you can create host group and define VM host group. Um, with that, you can define that this set of VM should be placed on this set of host group. Uh, CPI will respect that because it's a DRS rule and CPI supports DRS. So you can do that before you start the deployment. Uh, if you don't have an existing VM group, CPI will go ahead and create the VM group and add VMs to it. And after that, you can create your VM host rule uh, and apply that to your created VMs. Next, we'll look at NSXT, which is the opaque network uh, that Tisha was talking about. In this, uh, I've created two server pools. So if you want to use load balancer feature with NSXT, uh, you need to create your load balancer, virtual servers, and server pools before you start using them with the CPI. So in this case, um, CPI actually does not go ahead and create the load balancer and virtual server or server pools. It expects them to be present beforehand. Uh, once you've created your server pools, you can specify them in your cloud config like I showed you earlier. And CPI will go ahead and add VMs to those server pools. Um, your server pool can be static or dynamic. As, as you can see, CPI pool one is static and CPI pool two is dynamic. Uh, a dynamic server pool is a server pool which is associated to one of the security group, which is called NS group and NSXT. Uh, that security group uh, has different membership criteria uh, when you create it. And depending on that, a virtual machine will get added to that security group. So those are my two uh, server pools. The first one, if you go and look at, it has no members. Um, this is the second one, which is dynamic. And if you see, it is got NS group, NS group one is the security group for that. Uh, our deployment is done. Um, let's go and look at our VM type large, where we have specified our VM group to be CPI VM group. Uh, now we'll go and look at our vCenter. Just a second. Okay. So if you go back to the cluster, which was cluster one, where our VMs were deployed. And look at the CPI VM group. So this VM group was created by CPI and both the VMs were added to this VM group. Um, the next thing is we're going to look at data store cluster properties. So we specified a data store cluster and a local data store as part of our data store property in cloud config. CPI will use the placement algorithm that Tushar talked about and will pick the best placement option from the given storage data store cluster or the data stores that were provided. In this case, uh, we expect the CPI to pick data store cluster that we have provided. So if we click at one of those VMs, or if we go to the data store cluster directly, you'll see both the VMs uh, were created inside this data store cluster which has data store iSCAS and CL1 DS4. So our both VMs are created inside this data store cluster. Now we'll go and look at one of the VMs and look at the data source that it is using. So if you click at one of the VMs and look at the data source, you'll see that it is using two data sources. One is iSCSI CL1 DS4 and another one is CL1 DS4. The second data store belongs to the data store cluster. That's where our ephemeral disk and the VM files are placed. The first data store is uh, where the persistent disk for this VM was created. So this is also something specific to cloud properties I have specified in my disk type that my disk should be placed in this specific data store. So let's go and look at the cloud properties. Um, I have not shown the disk type. So if you look at under this type, I have specified the data store to be iSCAS ECL1 DS1. That's where my persistent does start place for that VM. Now, next, we're going to look at the server pools uh, where the VMs were added. 
So we have two server pools and one security group that we've specified over here. So if we go and look at NSXT and go to CPI pool one, which is the membership type for this is static. So my both VMs were added to this server pool. Um, the next is we look at CPI pool two. This is a dynamic server pool. So this is tied with NS group one. So we'll go and look at NS group one. And in NS group one, we'll see that there were two members which were added to this NS group. So if you go, if you see over here, there are two effective members. Uh, if you click on that, we'll see both the VMs were added to this security group. Also, as part of the uh, NSXT configuration, we have specified a separate security group called as NS Group 2. So your VMs will also be added to this security group. Um, so both the VMs got added to this security group uh, as well. That's it. Um, yeah, so that's how you can use one group or server pools or data stuff so as part of your um, CPI. With this, I'll hand it over to Karim, who will walk you through managed networks. Here's some slides too. Yeah. Any questions? Not at this moment. Okay. All right. So let's switch gear a little bit and talk about another uh, open source contribution that we did, not just to the CPI, but pretty much to the Bosch ecosystem. And that is the Bosch networking feature. What do I mean by the Bosch networking feature? So if we look at Bosch, just to give some context, usually when you use Bosch, you use Bosch to automate the creation of VMs or the creation of storage on any IS. But there was no solution for automating networking. So basically, if you want to create a deployment on Bosch, what you, may, what you usually do is that you go ahead to your IS that you're using, and then you manually have to create the network, and then you use Bosch to create a deployment, and in your deployment manifest, in your cloud config, you basically reference this network that you manually created before, which is a very painful process most of the time, because sometimes you just want a network. You want a deployment, you want the network to be automated, you want everything to be automated by the deployment manifest that you provide. So this is a feature that we added, and this feature actually requires um, contribution to the CPI, contribution to Bosch, contribution to the Bosch CLI. So it was a major contribution that we provided, um, and uh, we basically do the creation of the network now, we do the deletions of the network automatically, we're working on network updates as well. Uh, so pretty much all the network life cycle um, is part of this feature that we're uh, implementing. Okay, so what is the solution that we uh, provide? Well, the solution that we provide is basically just automate this creation of the network and the deletion of the network and the update of the network. And this requires adding some new methods to the CPI that didn't exist before. Uh, for example, create network, which will basically go ahead to the IS and create a specific network. In the case of vSphere, we go to NSXT, and then we create a bunch of routers and switch, create the network based on the configuration that the user provides. Same thing with the late network. And of course, we, we needed to um, also be able to talk to this new CPI methods from Bosch, which required also some changes in Bosch, because you need to keep track of the state of the networks that you already have. You need to be able to list the networks and so on and so forth. Um, so with that said, let's look at the demo. And the demo is probably going to be um, a very simple demo that anyone can understand. Um, it's going to be uh... there you go. Don't click on it again. Okay, this one. That's fine. Close. Close my demo. Just, just yeah, just open it. Double click. All right. There you go. So what we're going to do is we are going to 
assume that we want to create this deployment. So we have a Zookeeper deployment that is on this specific network, 172.16.10.0 slash 24. We're going to call it a Zookeeper network. In vSphere, to do this, we need to create a T1 router and then connect this deployment to this T1 router and then connect this T1 router to the T0 router. And basically, that, that thing over here that is connecting all the VMs is the switch that is connecting all these VMs. And we assume that um, the director is on a different network connecting to another T1 router. So there's connectivity between these two parts over there. So let's assume we want to use Bosch to have this deployment. So if we wanted to do that with Bosch that does not support managed networks, what we needed to do is we basically have to go to NSXT, the NSXT manager, and manually create all these components that I just discussed. So for example, the first thing we need to do is create a T1 router, give it a name, and then connect this T1 router to the T0 router. T0 router, by the way, if you don't know what NSXT um, is, basically it's the, the router that connects you to the out, outside world. And the T1 router is the router that's going to connect to the switch that's going to be part of your deployment. Another thing that we need to do for the T1 router is to basically enable route advertisement so that the T0 router can know about the existence of this T1 router and all the IP addresses that are defined there. And once we create the T0 router and the T1 router, we also need to create the switch. So we create the Zookeeper network switch. And then another thing we need to do is connect this switch to the T1 router. So we create a logical port between in the T1 router and connect it to this switch. Okay, so with that, we will also give the IP address that we discussed before, the 172 IP address, to be the IP address of the, the port. So with that, all the components that we need for the network is already there. So the next step is to basically just go to the deployment manifest and deploy the Zookeeper uh, deployment that we needed to deploy. But we have to reference this network in the cloud config. We have to tell Bosch like, hey, we have this network in the IS right now, and I want to create a deployment on that network that I just manually created. And here is the, the network section in the cloud config. So this is the cloud config, and here is where we basically define the network that we created. And as you can see, if you look at the cloud properties over here, we basically give the name of the networks, the logical switch that we want the deployment to be connected to. And then after that, we create a deployment manifest. So to create a deployment in Bosch, you need two things. You need to have a cloud config already in Bosch. And then you have to create a deployment manifest for the actual deployment that you want to deploy. So as you can see here in the instance groups, the, the Zookeeper, let's go back. So as you can see here, we have the instance group, the Zookeeper, Deployment is basically referencing the Zookeeper network that we have defined in the cloud config. And then after that, we just deploy. There's deployment of the Zookeeper is going on. And in a few seconds it will be done because we're speeding things up. This is usually a, a long process. All right, so everything I just mentioned was the status of Bosch before our feature. Now um, I'm going to discuss what we actually changed. So now we have vSphere and NSXT that doesn't have any network. All we need to do in this case, we don't have to go and manually create the networks beforehand. All we need to do is basically just put everything in the cloud config. 
So let's, let's take a look at how the cloud config will look like in this case. So here's the network sections in the cloud config after our change. Pretty much everything is the same except for this managed part here, where we're basically telling Bosch, hey Bosch, this is a managed network, so please go ahead and create this network in the IS. And if you look at the cloud properties over here, it kind of changed. We basically need to tell Bosch some um, information about the NSXT network that we have. So we, ha we, we give the edge cluster ID, we give the T0 router ID, the transport zone ID, and a switch name, which is, which is optional. But that's pretty much all we need to do. We didn't go ahead and create the network beforehand. We just changed the cloud config. And then if you look at the deployment manifest afterwards, it's exactly the same. So in the cloud config, we just have instance groups, Zookeeper, and it's referencing the same Zookeeper network that we have now in the cloud config, but we haven't actually created. And then if we deploy now, what's going to happen is Bosch is going to go ahead. Let's deploy. So this is the case of, uh, this is the state of the NSXT. There's no T1 router. All of these T1 routers are part of um, the infrastructure. They're not really the T1 router that is connected to the Zookeeper ne network. So NSXT doesn't have any networks created yet. And now we deploy. Deployment is going on. And then as you can see now, um, we have a new tier one router created, which is part of the deployment. If you look at the switches, the logical switches, we can also see that the Zookeeper network was created. And the VMs are connected to that logical switch. So pretty much the same state that we, we had before, but instead of manually creating the networks, it was just automatically created for us. So this part where we create networks and delete networks is already there um, in an alpha state in Bosch. We're also working on the update network part. If you already have an existing network and you want to update it, we're working on that as well. So hopefully that will make your life easy um, when you want to deploy networks through Bosch. And that's pretty much it. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kiyash to talk about feature work. Um, I do have a, a few questions regarding the, uh, the network work here. I, I think this is really, really impressive. So from a, uh, from a Bosch admin perspective, all they would need to do is to change that small, uh, those small lines in the configuration and then everything just works. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's awesome. Uh, so I know this is a very, very new feature. It's in alpha state right now. Um, the, um, is there work going on to implement this on any other CPI right now, or is it so new that it hasn't been adopted by anyone yet? Uh, we're working with the other CPIs right now. So um, we just reached out to Azure and Google yesterday. Um, so one now that, that this is an alpha, they'll start mm -hmm. implementing this as well on their side. Very cool. Very cool. This is this is great to see. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Kareem. Let me just go back to. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep this short. But we wanted to just give you an idea about what we're going to work on in the next release. Um, so most of the ISs out there already have uh, support for some sort of encryption. Um, in vSphere, we did add uh, vSphere did add this feature for VM encryption in 6.5. Um, prior to that, you did have encryption, but that was at the whole data store level, right? So an admin encrypts the whole data store. Um, with the new feature, we want to add support for that one, so that you know you can encrypt a VM and disk attached to that VM uh, at a per VM level. Um, so we want to work on that. Uh, we also want to work on storage policies. So right now you have to specify uh, data stores or data store clusters, uh, but going forward, you can also just say uh, the storage, I want this application to be deployed in the storage policy, we just say gold, and Bosch will automatically talk to vSphere and figure out uh, uh, which are the data stores uh, that it, the VM should get placed on. Uh, we're also doing some work on the GPU side of things. Um, over here, we're trying to just make sure that the VM lands on a host which have GPUs attached to them. 
Uh, so we're doing that work as well. Um, and some cosmetic changes in the VCTA UI. Uh, right now, when you create a VM, uh, all the VMs, the names that they get are just essentially just a UID. They do not really denote anything in terms of what these VMs do. Uh, so we are trying to add a prefix or somehow try to change the name of these VMs so that you know, they denote you know, which instance group are they part of or are they, which applications do they belong to. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff uh, that we're planning to work on in the next release. Uh, that's all we had. Um, if you guys want to take a look at our repo, uh, you guys can go uh, to the GitHub link posted over here. Um, if you want to reach out to us, we're on Slack. You can Slack in the Bosch channel or the Bosch CPI dev channel. And you can always reach out to us on an email with vsk.cpi at vmware.com. These Slack channels is for the Cloud Foundry uh, Slack.com. Yeah. It's an open source Cloud Foundry Slack channel. Slack. Yeah. With that, um, any questions? Um, I don't see any more questions right now. Uh, so I would like to thank you all. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been presenting today. Uh, this has been really, really uh, useful. A lot of new information and it's great to see um, where the vSphere CPI has, um, has evolved. Uh, throughout the past year here, and it's really, really interesting to see um, the, the future roadmap of this project here. I uh, want to thank everyone who's been attending as well. This will be uh, posted up on the Cloud Native Apps uh, YouTube channel uh, shortly here. So thank you all for, for joining, and again, thank you uh, to all the presenters here, and um, we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys.